So, electrified privacy glass, custom walnut cat door. Seems pretty elaborate for just a closet. But this closet is going to be my new studio office for video editing, podcasting, and doing voiceovers. And when the film is off, like this, it's white, which is basically my on-air signal, telling people, oh, he's busy, I'll grab a seat in the green room, grab a refreshment, and check back later. But, is it really as good as they say it is? So I'm gonna show you start to finish how I made this door, install this privacy film by Smart Tint, and let you know what I really think about it. So let's get started. First thing to do here is take some measurements. Boop. Yeah, gotta make sure you and Lola can get in and I don't have to open the door every time. Let's mill up some poplar. And since I was in the neighborhood of my buddy Tim and Mike down at True Trade Carpentry, I took advantage of their giant 16 inch jointer. Now, since this is a door, I really want this material perfectly flat and square. And since this has much longer in feed and out feed beds, I felt much more confident on these long eight foot pieces for the size of the door that I could get those nice and flat versus my machine, which has about two feet of in feed and out feed. So I'll flatten one face and one edge here and then head back to my shop and run it through the planer to get the other side flat and parallel and then we'll let it stack and sticker. Now what stack and stickering does is allows that fresh wood that's been exposed to absorb moisture, to release moisture, just to reacclimate to the environment and let it move however it wants to move. And then after a day or two, I can bring it down to final dimension. I always leave at least an eighth of an inch of extra material and thickness when doing this. All right, Jerry, it's in your hands now. You're on watch duty. And shockingly, the next day, this wood hadn't moved at all. It was still perfectly flat, so there was no reason to bring it back to the joiner. I was able to just run it through the planer to get it down to final thickness, which in this case is an inch and three eighths. Now I could rip my rails and styles down to rough width and yeah, rails and styles. This is essentially just a big cabinet door. And by rough width, I mean just a hair over the final dimension because I wanna take them over to the joiner to clean up any saw marks there. Then at the chop saw, I could start cutting my rails to rough width, but the first order business was the multiple pieces that would need to be glued up for the large bottom rail for the cat door. So what we have here is your classic cat door, chicken and the egg story. I really wanted to glue this panel up as one and then cut out this door with the shaper origin. But I realized then I wouldn't really be able to get my drill or anything in here to cut the recesses for these sauce hinges. So what I'm going to do since I have this in three separate pieces is I'm just going to cut this out right here so I have a perfectly flat square edge and then use the shaper origin to cut these recesses for the hinges. I'll have to do the same thing in the door panel, but I'm actually, once I cut this out, since I'll need to use a bigger bit, the reveal will be too big. So I'm gonna make a fresh door out of maple. Maybe I'll make it out of walnut. So with that critical decision made, I could now cut up the middle part of my glue up and prep it for the mortises for the hinges. And this is where reading the instructions on a piece of hardware comes in really handy and I didn't. So for these sauce hinges that I'm using, they're actually just for three quarter inch doors, not an inch and three eighths like I have here. However, you can make them work if the mortises are positioned in the right place. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's get these cut in the wrong place. I'm using the Shaper Origin. They actually have this specific hinge in their hardware library. So I just need to download it and cut the multi-depth mortises as defined in the Shaper Origin itself and then test fit the pieces. Unfortunately, as you can see here, there's this little welded shoulder on these hinges which prevent it from going all the way flush. So I had to grab my Dremel, do a little dental work in there and buzz a little round over on it and then we could put it in and it sits nice and flush. Unfortunately, it was at this point, and I just realized that when you go to open this, there's no way, there's not enough room there if I have the same thickness of door there to open. And then I look at the instructions and it shows this fold line 
needs to go over the door. So it looks like the hinge needs to be placed one eighth of an inch away from the edge in order for it to work. So time to cut this off and start over. So all I did was reposition my mortises on the shape of origin, recut them, and now we can test fit the hinges. And as you can see, they are very close to the edge, but within spec and it should work. Now to cut the arch top of the door, I grabbed the shape of origin again, basically just created a file of a circle in there with the diameter that I needed, which based on the three and three quarter inch radius I have written there is a seven and a half inch diameter. So then I could clean this up, well, not really clean it up, roughly clean it up with a jigsaw and then head over to the router table with a flush trim bit and get that all perfectly nice and flush and smooth. Then it was time for glue up. Now this may seem like a simple glue up, slap a few boards together, no big deal. However, I needed to make sure that that middle rail of this rail was aligned perfectly with the arch top because there was really no way to go in there and clean that up because it's the exact dimension I wanted. So I had to be careful here. You can see me just adjusting, making sure it's nice and flush with each squeeze of the clamp. Of course, the glue wanting to slide everywhere. So it took a little fiddling, but I eventually got it exactly where I wanted it to be. And then I could set that and let it dry. And once it was all sanded, it was time to see if Jerry wanted to give it a dry run. No! <laughs> Goober! Well, hopefully that experience wasn't too traumatic for the little guy and he'll still go through the door when it's officially done. All right, on to less hilarious things. Now I'm just laying out all my rails into position just to give me an idea of what this door is gonna look like. And then to figure out how long these rails actually need to be because the width of the door is fixed because I know the opening it's going into, but the length of these rails also need to include the length of an integrated tenon on each side. Once my maths was done on that, then I could head over to the table saw using a crosscut sled and cut all these pieces to their final length. And Jerry, of course, had to stick his little nose in there for every single piece. And look who just showed up. Where are you going? Uh-uh-uh, back here. Watch out, Jerry's coming for you. Woo, told you. Now I cut the outer styles of the door long so I'd be able to trim the whole door as one piece top and bottom once everything was glued up. So I'm just using some one inch spacers at the bottom to make sure everything is the same distance and then clamping everything together. And then I can pull a measurement off the bottom rail to where the top rail needs to be positioned and draw a line there. Now I do believe I failed to mention earlier that the top and bottom rail, I did cut a little bit on the wider side because I knew I would be trimming them. I think I left about an eighth of an inch extra material. And let's not forget a layout line for that middle rail. And we can move that into position and clamp it in place. And then I could start laying out for the position of all my tenons and mortises. Now on this middle rail, I mean, this was a mistake, but it was really just lack of knowledge, I think. In my mind, I thought I could kind of make a four, five, or six inch tenon on the Panto router, which I'll be using, but it only goes up to three inches. So I had Lola redo all the layout and calculations. And what we came up with is on the top rail, we're gonna use one three inch mortise and tenon. In the middle rail, we'll do two at two and a half inches. And the bottom, the big bulky one, We'll do three monster tenons at three inches. Now this door is way overbuilt for what it is, just an interior door, but hey, that's what I do. I overbuild. Now, could you use the Festool Domino for something like this? Yes, I think you could. If this was an exterior door, no. But a small, kind of lightweight interior door, you could. But, you know, I really wanted to get my feet wet with this Panto router, and this was the perfect time for it. But the one drawback was because of the large tenons and how I had them spaced, I had to do each one individually. I couldn't double stack the templates on top. So it definitely took a while to do all this joinery. But in the end, this door is pretty much bomb proof. I mean, I don't really live in a bomb prone area, but you never know. With this whole AI revolution, anything could happen. So now with all my mortises cut, I can cut the mating tenons on all of my rails. And to do that, I'm using this honking half inch spiral upcut bit from Bits and Bits. My gosh, this thing is a beast. 
As you can see, it makes quick work of this lightweight poplar. Now, since the panto router has templates and you use the same template to cut the mortise and the tenon, you can still fine tune them, but you always want to cut your mortises first to ensure those are all the same and then use a scrap piece and cut a sample tenon and fit that. Once it fits, then you can run them all and you know everything will fit. So after the single tenons, I did the doubles and then the triples. Oh yeah, that's some serious overkill there. I like it. Now just a little test fit to show you. Nice and snugly. And now a satisfying dry fit to make sure everything fits together nicely, squarely, and tightly, and get ready for the next operation. Now the bottom panel will get a half inch thick MDF panel. And I'm gonna wrap it out the back of this and set it in there. Now, another option would have been to cut a groove or a dado all the way around and then glue the whole door together with the panel in it, kind of like you would with a cabinet door. But uh, I didn't wanna do that because on the long rails, I would have had to make stop dado cuts and it just would have been a whole thing. So I needed to cut out a recess or a rabbit for the glass on the top anyway. So I figured I'll just do them both the same way. Now it took a few passes and lots of sawdust to get down to the depth I wanted with this rabbit. But once that was all done, I could finally get this door glued up. Now, because this wood was probably pretty thirsty, I didn't want to use regular PVA glue and fight the clock. Total boat, baby. So I'm using some Total Boat Fixo to give me that extra open time and ensure that uh, Jerry here doesn't go crazy with stress during this glue up. Although I'm not sure anything stresses him out. Now, if I've been using standard PVA, by this time, that stuff probably would have been starting to skin over and dry, and this would have been a real struggle. But with that epoxy still nice and fluid, whoop, a lot of squeeze out there. Everything came together pain and stress-free. Then we could get it in the clamps and let it dry overnight. But first, let's make sure everything did come together square. I mean, that's the beauty of that Panto router, these huge mortise and tenons. They are self-squaring, basically. As you can see there, it's pretty much perfect. Oh yeah, I guess you've earned a big stretch. What are you, are you sticking your tongue out at me? What, what is that all about? So the next day, clamps came off and we could get this thing kind of flipped over, check everything and sand off all that squeeze out, make sure all those joints are nice and flush and flat. What? Okay, maybe later. I did the sanding and then there was a little bit of housekeeping to do. I needed to square up all of these rabbits. So just a little chisel and a mallet, get them nice and square and ready for trim on the bottom and glass and trim on the top. Now we mentioned earlier that I would be using an MDF panel in the bottom. So just using some half inch MDF here, cutting it down to size on the table saw. And even though the MDF panel is going to be stable, the wood around it will not. So I am priming this before I put it in. That way, if there's any expansion, contraction, movement in the wood around, you won't actually see a paint line if I paint it once it's in place. So just slap some primer on there. And by the way, this Sherwin-Williams primer is such <laughs> Six days later, I went to sand this thing and it was still like gummy. And don't give me environmental conditions. It was 25% humidity and 75 degrees in my shop. The perfect drying condition. So this is what I get for cheating on Benjamin Moore. They weren't open on Sunday and I had to go slumming and I paid for it. All right, enough about paint. Let's start making our walnut cat door. So I'm just setting up a panel here with some shaper tape just to get my workspace in order so I can cut this door. Now this totally adorable line drawing of Jerry and Lola was created by my friend Mary at Kodamari Design for what we are calling Shop Cat Nation. T-shirts coming soon. And to carve this into the door, I'm using this 132nd bit. Very fragile, very small, very delicate, but I didn't want this to be too big. I mean, the door is small, so I wanted a nice, intricate, detailed carving. And to do this, well, I just went around and followed all the lines. This took quite a bit of time, but in the end, it came out pretty darn sweet. And now leaving the workpiece in the same position, I can cut out the round circle for the window, as well as the actual outer shape of the door. Now this took several passes to get down to the full depth of an inch and three eighths, but just took my time and went around and around and around. And here it is all cut out. 
And then a quick dry fit just to make sure it fits in the opening. And we're looking good. Now we cut the mortises in the door frame for the hinges, but now we need to cut them in the actual door. So to lay everything out, I'm just using some yellow frog tape here, better visibility with a pencil, and then I can just transfer my lines over from my actual door using some 16th spacers on the bottom, transfer those over, get them laid out, back to the shaper origin and cut those mortises. And then we can do a test fit of this door. Uh-oh. That's not right. Okay, so just like a traditional door, which we'll have to do along this edge, the strike plate edge, is put a two to three degree bevel on that so that it can clear the jam. We're gonna have to do that here as well. Why must there always be a problem? Hey Lola, can you give me a hand? Alrighty then. So my buddy Tim over at True Trade Carpentry said, hey, just tilt your uh, belt sander to three degrees and touch up that corner and it should work fine. All right, let's see if that worked. Ooh, okay. So it looks like I didn't really need to bevel this edge. It was just that top that was hitting. Yeah, that's a bummer. Now when I tell you I'm going all out on this door, I'm going all out on this door. So this round opening will be getting a piece of quarter inch safety glass as well. Took a few passes to get to the final depth, but there you go. And then, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, no, it's just an $80 microphone, no problem. I needed to create a custom piece of trim that would hold the glass in, and then also create a nice little border around the opening. So with the Shaper Origin, I'm basically cutting a rabbited piece of round trim. And I didn't go all the way through my piece here, so I went over to the bandsaw, covered it with some tape so it wouldn't fall out, and just basically resawed the piece off, removed the tape, and revealed this, basically a stepped ring. Now I double-sided the tape back down to a scrap piece just so I could get everything sanded and it wouldn't move around on me. And yes, I did do this without doing that and it went flying across the room like a discus. And here's how it will fit in the door and hold the glass in. As you can see here, there's a quarter inch gap for the glass to fit. I mean, you know, pretty standard cat door. All right, so I used the Shaper Origin to cut this piece of curved trim for the door. It looks good. So I took some walnut and glued it up, segmented around. This is all continuous grain. And then I just cleaned up some of this. So this now fits in here. I'll use some double-sided tape. And now I'll run around this with the Shaper Origin to produce the same thing out of walnut. Now I actually had to make two pieces of this arched trim, one for the outside of the door and one for the inside of the door. Now the one for the inside of the door, oh, I ran into quite a problem with that that we'll discuss later on in the video, but it was just another opportunity for a crafty solution, I guess. And on to the next part of the door, which is of course is the threshold. I mean, you gotta have that. So I'm taking a piece of walnut here and I'm rabbiting out about a half inch material that's inch and three eighths wide, a little bit wider than that. And this will fit into the opening and on top of the sill of the door. So with the rabbit cut and the basically wings marked out, I could cut those on the table saw, standing vertically for that cut and then horizontally to meet that and remove that piece. And then I could do a quick dry fit. See if that fits in the opening. That looks good. So then it was all about just trimming all that excess waste away. I mean, I don't need a giant doorstop like that. With that removed, I put a little chamfer on all those edges, you know? Can't have Lola and Jerry uh, get any splinters there as they enter. Now, as much as I want to finish that cat door right now, we need to move on to what I'm calling the magic film. That's gonna be the smart tint film on the top window of the door that will allow me with the use of a remote control to either frost the glass or make it clear. So basically privacy glass. Now to order the actual film, Smart Tint will send you this form to fill out, which you put in your rough dimension openings, your width, your height, and which side of the film and direction you want the wires to come out of. Now why privacy glass, you might be asking. And what that is, is because this is my recording studio. When it's clear, my wife or whoever else will know, okay, he's in there, he's recording the podcast or doing a voiceover. 
come back later. If it's clear, it's clear to come in. All right, once that was ordered, I could get back to the construction of the main door, gluing in that panel, and then creating some custom bevel trim to match the rest of the doors in the house. Using a 45 degree chamfer bit on the router table and a sacrificial fence that is set just forward of the bearing because I do not want that sharp edge that we're creating on this profile to be damaged by that. As you can see, it's a nice crisp edge. Then over to the table saw, and I will rip that off. Then take that freshly sawn edge over to the joiner, clean up those saw marks, back to the router table again, cut that chamfer, back to the table saw, cut it again and again until all of my pieces are cut. And then with a small parts fence, zero clearance insert thing at the miter saw, I can start cutting all my miters and fitting all these pieces of trim on the front and the back. This took a while, I'll have to say. That last piece gets fit in there with a little bit of flex, and then I'll just tack it in. I'm not used to doing paint grade stuff, so being able to use a pin nailer is kind of fun. Unfortunately, the whole nail filling hole thing, that's what drives me nuts. And it have a few gaps, so just some sawdust and glue, sand that down, paint will cover it all. Now when it came to do the panel on the inside of the bottom, well, somebody had other ideas, so I had to work around them. Now you might notice as this trim is going in, it's sitting a little bit proud of the actual door frame. That was due to how deep I needed to make the rabbit for the glass panel. Things weren't exactly centered perfectly on the door. Not to worry, that little edge will just be cleaned up with a block plane, sanded flush, of course, a little bit of wood filler in there. Paint will cover it all and you'll never know. Now before I could do any priming or painting of the door, I needed to cut all the holes for the lock sets and the mortises for the hinges. So I'm using shaper plate here, which is perfect for cutting the round hole for this lock set when you don't have a giant drill bit. So just make a giant circle and pop that out. Then I can flip it up on edge and cut the holes for the actual lock set to slide in. And of course, the really fun part of cutting that shallow mortise for the plate of the lock set to slide into. Just use a drill bit, cleaned it up with a router plane, slid it in, pre-drilled those holes with a Vix bit or a self-centering bit, and that was done. Now it was on to the hinges. Now, since my hinges needed to be in the exact same position as they were already on the existing jam, I just transferred those lines. And now I'm making this little jig out of MDF just to cut all my mortises. Pretty simple, took about 10 minutes to make, but it will ensure that each one is exactly the same size. Then I can just use a small pattern bit set to the same depth as the thickness of the hinge. Once that's cut, clean those corners up with a chisel and a quick test fit just to make sure everything looks good. Once that's confirmed, I can repeat the same process with the other two hinges. And then I could get back to the cat door. So it's time to glue in the little arch trim way to the uh, door sill, sorry, the door threshold. So I'm using a little bit of CA glue just for that instant grab and some PVA glue around it for that long-term grab. Now I'm using a little bit of wax paper underneath as you can see, just to avoid any squeeze out so it doesn't actually stick to the door itself. We're gonna install this later after everything's painted. And once that was dry and all sanded, then I could start finishing all the walnut parts for the door. Obviously the door, the door frame, threshold, and the round piece of trim. Now I could prime and paint the door I'm using Benjamin Moore Inselect sticks for the primer, and then Benjamin Moore Scuff-X in super white in satin finish to paint. So I did two coats of primer here, sanding in between coats, and then four coats of the actual scuff X on top. That should be plenty durable. Well, until Jerry sinks his claws into it. And thanks to the boys at True Trade for letting me use their shop as a spray booth. Once everything was dried, I could bring it back to my shop and start fitting the special trim that I'm gonna have to make to keep the glass in up top. It will need to be removable just in case anything ever happens to the glass and I need to replace it or take it out. So essentially what I'm going to make is a rabbited picture frame that sits in, holds the glass, and then I can screw it down on the perimeter. So the first step is to cut a rabbit on the table saw. I'm doing it on both sides of the board so I can get two pieces out of one at a clip. And then I can rip each of those strips off. And to get all those burn and saw marks off, 
I'm using double-sided tape to stick it to another piece of wood so I can run it through the planer and clean that up nice and clean. And then over at the miter saw, using a zero clearance backer so I don't get any tear out, I'll just cut all these little miters and fit my little frame in. Now this is only part one of this frame. As you can see, the trim on the front extends further into the opening, so I'm gonna have to cut another piece so that they are equal. But first, I'm just gonna get this frame glued up using a little bit of glue, some Collins miter clamp to hold that nice and tight, and then I'll have a large frame. So part two of this frame is to glue on some square stock around the inner perimeter while Jerry does whatever Jerry does. Once that was all done and dry, I could fit it in the opening and to kind of match that chamfer detail on the front, I'm just using a chamfering bit, making a couple passes all the way around here to ease that edge and try to make things look, you know, synergistically homogenous. Unfortunately, you have this little rounded detail in the corner when that's all done. So little chisel work to clean that up and everything is nice and square. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I will be attaching this with face-mounted countersunk screws. There might be a cleaner way to do this, maybe magnets, but I didn't. And now on to the installation of the magic film by Smart Tint. Full disclosure, this video is not sponsored by Smart Tint, but they did send me the materials for free to do this project, except for the contact switch, which I had to buy separately. I'll give you the breakdown of what this would cost you to install it yourself in just a few minutes, but first let's get this film unwrapped and see what else is inside. Looks like some silicone and this must be the power supply, some instructions. So let's cut this open. In here we have the actual power supply and the remote control, which will turn the film on or off. So clear or solid. Now I'm not a glass guy. So I called my buddy, Bill Burkle from WTB Woodworking, a professional glazer actually came up from Philadelphia area to help me out with this. So first order business was to clean the glass with some isopropyl alcohol. Make sure there's no lint, dust, cat hair, or anything on there that's gonna inhibit the sticking of this film on here. We don't want any bubbles. Well, we don't want any, but we had some issues. So first we're laying on the film just to make sure everything fits correctly. And then we can start peeling back the protective layer, just a couple of inches to expose some film and then lay it down on the glass. And almost like a cell phone screen protector, you'll see as it lays down, it'll start to stick. And then we'll just push out all those air bubbles using a little mini squeegee. Now, despite how fastidious we were about trying to get all the bubbles out, it was still quite a chore. Uh, I did talk to the people at Smart Tint who said leaving the film on, powered on for 24 hours after install, will help eliminate all those air bubbles as it off gases. We still ended up with just a couple, but it wasn't too bad at all. Now, unfortunately, we did run into some more lint and some cat hair, so Bill's great suggestion was just use some masking tape and we'll work our way down, stick it down and peel it back, and that definitely seemed to help a lot. Now, we did find that using a more rigid squeegee, like this little piece of walnut here, to get those air bubbles out was much better than just the regular plastic bendable squeegee. Finally though, we got to the end and we could squeegee out those last couple of inches. And then the little gray fur ball shedder was let back into the shop, which he was, which of course he was very excited to be part of the process again. Now, before we proceeded with anything else, Bill did a quick wire connection. We wanted to make sure everything was working. So I grabbed the remote. Oh, look at that. So cool. Now, in order to chase the wires through the door and into the door frame, we had to drill a hole all the way through the edge of the door. And then we could start the process of setting the glass in place, threading those wires through that access hole, and then getting everything secured. But first, I wanted to check my frame here and make sure it covered everything. That looks pretty good. Now, because those wires actually sit on top of the glass, I needed to route out a little channel in the back of my frame just so that it could sit nice and flush and flat. I do this with a little pattern bit with some extension feet or pontoons to keep that nice and flat so my router doesn't rock. And then we can double check the fit. Yep, that'll do, don't gay. So now, Bill, the glazer, is just putting some masking tape on we got some spacers set up. We used about an eighth of an inch all the way around. And then we can use the supplied silicone. We put a bead in each corner. Then we could scrape away the excess, make it nice and neat and clean. And we'll need to let this cure for 24 hours before I move it. Now, as you can see, there is another protective layer of clear film there. We're gonna leave that on to the very last moment because someone might scratch it. 
Now we could also set the little teeny round piece of glass in the cat door. So using the same process, just a little masking tape around. And then we use some eighth inch shim spacers here and the bead of silicone all the way around. And that should be plenty secure. And a huge thanks again to Bill Burkle for helping me out. And when he left, I just couldn't help playing with this switch. It's too much fun. While Lola tries her best to get at that glass, let me break down the cost of all of this for you. The safety glass was about $60. The smart tint film was $270. A tube of silicone, $7. The contact switch was $100. I'll show you what that is and how I installed it in just a minute. And the power supply and remote control was $224, bringing it to a grand total of $661. And here's the contact switch I was talking about. Now the original plan was to use an electrified hinge that has some sort of flexible conduit in it that we would be able to run the wires through and then when the door opens and closes, the wires won't get pinched. Unfortunately, those are only available for more commercial doors that are much thicker than this. So we had to go the contact switch route, which actually wasn't too bad. I obviously did have to mortise it into the door frame or the jam and then run my wires through there. I also needed to make a mating mortise in the door itself, which was a simple process of making a step mortise around the hole we had drilled earlier for the wires to be fished through. So once that was all done, I could cut the wires to length, wire up the contact switch and then secure it. And to wire up the contact switch and the actual door jam, just strip these wires a little bit they slide right into these holes. And then using the smallest screwdriver ever, can tighten that screw and it secures them in place. Then we can push it into the door frame and screw it home. Now, before I could get the door actually hung back in the frame, I needed to attach the hinges and then also attach the frame I made to keep the glass in place. Well, the silicone's keeping it in place. This is just added security. Now I did paint all the tips of these screw heads white so they blended a little bit better, but it might actually have looked better if I had cut holes and then put plugs over them. Hindsight is a dish best served cold, I guess. Now for speed, ease, and the risk of not going too overboard with this cat door, I just painted the inside of the jam black, and then I could actually glue on the outer frame with the door threshold as well. And I hit a couple of 23 gauge pin nails in the grain just to keep it secure. Then I could also glue in the round door trim. Now, since I rubioed over everything, I just sanded away a few choice spots and then using some total boat thickso, spread that around, drop it in and clamp it. Sometimes I wonder about these two. I mean, what are they looking at under there? Probably my missing pencil or tape measure. Now, if you recall, I said I made a big mistake with the door trim of the inside of the door. As you can see here, it is very thin. That's because I had three eighths inch thick material and with my hinges being in the correct position, this basically just added more thickness and the door wouldn't open. So I resawed the whole frame on the table saw, went over to my buddy Pete's, ran it through the drum sander and ended up with effectively a 1 16th of an inch piece of trim all the way around. Man, who knew a small cat door like this would be such a kick in the fur balls. Whew, all worth it though. And of course the inside here needed a little door stoop. So just using some CA glue, I sanded away the paint there to give me nice adhesion, spread a bead and glued this on. Now I was planning to make a custom door pull for this, but I remembered from when I did my tambour cabinet, I had a few of these left over that I didn't like. They were the wrong size. So it's just a piece of walnut with India ink and a little piece of copper in the end. And alas, it was finally time to hang the door and see how everything works. Now, typically cheap hinges come with a bunch of short screws, but when dealing with a heavier door like I am now, you really want to use long screws, especially in that top hinge, so it's fully secured into the actual wall framing. All right, time to test this. Let's see if... Hey! Jerry. Come here, come in, come on, come on, yay, <laughs> it works, first try, hi buddy, what do you think about that, good stuff.
All right, hindsight is always 2020. I didn't realize I was gonna be using the contact switch way back, so I had already patched the drywall, but what I did do is I cut this wall back open, I ran those wires through the back, replaced the drywall, put the casing back on, painted everything, then installed the mounting bracket for the power supply. And I also found this electrical coupling flange at the hardware store that I painted to match the walls. And then I could thread my wire through. I'm just using a piece of foam here that I put a slice in, wraps around that wire, and then settles into the little coupling and keeps everything nice and firm and in place so it won't be pulled back into the wall. And then I could hook it up to the power supply and plug that in. Now the burning question is, is this smart tin film really 93% transparent as the manufacturer claims? Well, it depends. I don't have a tint meter so I can't give you any hard data, but I can show you what I'm seeing. As you can see straight on, it looks relatively clear, but as you look at an angle, it gets pretty hazy. Now the manufacturer did confirm that it has a lot to do with lighting conditions in the space. So if you have bright LEDs in the room or sunlight coming through, the haze would be more extreme at an angle. Also, if the walls were painted yellow, the haze would be more extreme. You will have the best clarity when looking straight on as it's a linear technology. But I'm perfectly fine with the way it is. I love it. I just want to give you the full details of what I'm seeing in this application, that it's not perfectly clear head on, and when you look at an angle, it's definitely hazy. But a huge thanks to Smartin for providing the materials for this project, as well as the behind the scenes guidance for installation. Now this door is just the beginning of this whole podcast, studio, editing, office space build out. I have a whole walnut floating desk to do with drawers and a curved front. There's going to be integrated power and USB and monitors on the wall, floating shelves on either side. This back wall is going to have some artwork, some parametric artwork. This wall is going to be kind of the cat wall. There's going to be some beds and climbing posts for Jerry and Lola. I may even build a custom walnut light fixture above. So plenty more still to come. If you're not subscribed and you want to, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any videos that are upcoming. But until then, I think I'll just be in here kind of brainstorming ideas.